I don't have time for this bullshit. Huh, bullshit, bullshit, bullshit. All this guy ever does is BS. Anyway, it's time for another edition of BSN with Big Nate. of BS with Big Nate going to the Great White North, True North, We're going up to Canada. And uh, it, it's always a pleasure for me to A, go up to Canada and B, do what I'm about to do. But uh, I'm joined, of course, by Brandon of Drop Top Alibi. And we're going to have some fun. Brandon, first of all, thanks for joining me. Hey man, thanks for having me again. It's nice to see you. It's been a little while. How's how's the family? How's life? What's new with you? Uh, everything is going really solid for me, but that's not what we're here to talk about. Uh, <laughs> Maple Leafs. What uh, the hell, man? They're doing great. Yeah, uh, really? You think so? <laughs> well, they're doing better than my Anaheim Ducks. I'm going to be real honest with you. It's uh, been a rough and tumble season for us. 
So, yeah, no, and, I hear you, man. It's just, I don't know. It's one of those things where like they, the goaltending scary for the Leafs. They they're losing games, like blowing big leads. It's like, you know, it's great. Austin Matthews is probably going to get 60 and they got Mark Giordano and Riley's playing well, but it's like, Man, if you if they don't win a playoff series this year, I think that team's gonna get blown up straight up. Like they'll fire the coach, they'll straight up trade one of their high profile guys. Like, I don't know. They they gotta win a series this year. No, and and and, and I think right now the pieces are there. It's not playoff hockey right now. It, it, it it's regular season. They they are sitting in a pretty good spot in, in entire league standings, but like you said, it it does seem like the wheels are kind of not falling off, but they're 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 rumbling uh you, you they're wobbly like after you get a tire change done and somebody didn't torque your bolts you know but i i, I think they're <laughs> gearing up i think this could be the leafs year maybe it's gonna come down to if, if campbell's gotta play the best hockey he's ever played in his life that's for sure you know i mean it, it, at least you're not a canadians fan or a uh, uh seattle kraken fan However, I, I, I do. We haven't talked since the Kraken have joined the league. How do you feel about hockey in the Pacific Northwest? I've, I've always thought Seattle should have a hockey team. Like Seattle's, it's a great city. It's the good vibe. It's so similar to Vancouver, which is, you know, the, the closest major Canadian city to them. Um, it's just, yeah, I know it's a smaller town, but, you know, for how good the Seahawks are, you know, I think the NBA wants to get back there. The NHL should have been there years ago. I wish they had the same draft lotto that the Vegas Knights did because fucking Las Vegas hockey was sick right out of the gate. And why they decided that, oh, they built too good a team and and changed how they're going to expand. It's like you – you want your expansion teams to be successful and Seattle's going to be shit for like 10 years now. It's like, Oh, I don't know. I wish the league managed see, that better, but I'm happy to see Seattle as a team. The, the league always does weird shit like that. It, it, it does. It, it, it blows my mind. Um, particularly being a ducks fan and then watching kind of California hockey expand and grow and do what it's done. Of course, LA has been there for, basically fucking forever but to have vegas come in and and like you mentioned be that powerhouse i was hoping for that same success with seattle because seattle is 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 kind of when i retire that's where i want to move and i want them to have a great fucking hockey team and it seems like they kind of just tried to kneecap them yeah, it's, I don't know. They got it right with Vegas and then they changed. It's like, you know, oh, there's so many good players. It's like, yeah, that's the point. You know, they built, they built four, four lines out of second line players and had it and almost won the Stanley cup. And they've been relatively like, you know, oh, it was that year was also when the big shooting happened. It was the team's first year. Like you're playing on a lot of like, you know, real life energy there and, you know, flurry, played his best season in his career maybe you know it's like and then once all of that wasn't there they're pretty they're not a bad team but they're not a threat every year in the west you know it's i don't understand why the nhl felt like they had to change the process for that because they had a successful out of the gate franchise and they just decided that wasn't a good formula (laughs) i don't know why so what's the impression in canada gary bettman is a commissioner Oh, he's a fucking idiot. He, 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 he would, he would sell his mother's soul to the devil to keep NHL franchises out of Canada because he's a fucking well, scumbag lawyer who's just obsessed with expanding the league in the U S which is great, but there's two cities in Canada that could float successful. Yeah. I, I, no, I, I think you're absolutely spot on. I, I, I think back, he should have been done with that. Uh, I, I don't know if you've seen the 30 for 30 on it, of course, the, the big shot where that guy came in and bought the Islanders with no actual secured funds. Yeah. Like, he fell for that hook, line, and sinker, and then now they've put him in charge of the whole fucking league. Blows my mind. Of course, we didn't come to talk hockey, but uh, 
whenever I get the chance, I like to do it. So <laughs> thank you for uh, you know what? fulfilling that need for me. No problem. It's always my pleasure. And what I'll leave, what I'll leave it off with is money talks. And as much as everyone here in Canada and pretty much around the NHL hates Gary Bettman, owners love him because he successfully grew the game in the United States almost single-handedly, almost to the detriment of the sport and of the league. You know, why does Phoenix have a team? But, you know, without Phoenix hockey and without Shane Doan, maybe you don't get Austin Matthews. So it's like, it's one of those things, right? You know, it's, he's a slimeball lawyer who's real good at what he does and owners love him and the NHL makes money. So that's, that's that, right? <laughs> that's true. And I, I, I guess it is a valid point as, as long as the sport is in the public eye, it does benefit all of us as much as uh, we can sit there and bitch about Gary Bettman, but drop top Al. At least he's not Roger. Goodell. That's very ah. true. Very accurate. Of course. Uh, let's see. Uh, Canadian football. What do we got there? Yeah. We have the CFL, uh, which if it wasn't for the NFL giving the money every year would have folded like 40 years ago. But um, it's, uh, yeah, there's eight teams, I think. And there's some good players, man. Like the game's different. It's a bigger field, bigger ball, three downs. Um, obviously difference in skill level. The way the linemen line up from each other is like at the scrimmage is, is a full yard apart. Like there's, there's nuances that are different. Um, but the skill level, like it's fun game to watch um but there's not a lot of good talent in the league so you'll be watching a game and a perfect like 25 yard you know deep post over the middle that the quarterback sails over the linebacker and right in front of the safety will hit the wide receiver right in the hands here and it just gets and they drop it it's like what the fuck man like that like i, I could have made that catch in high school what are you doing dropping that ball? But that's the CFL, man. <laughs> Who do you follow in pro football? Um, well, I lived in Windsor for a couple of years, which is a border city from Detroit. And it was in Matthew Stafford's second season in the league. Calvin Johnson was in the league. It was in Dominican Sue's rookie year. And boy, oh boy, Detroit Lions football was fun to watch for a few years there. Um, painstakingly i've always liked the eagles uh because my dad's an eagles fan and buddy i gotta tell you when i found out that matt stafford asked for a trade and the lions gave it to him i was like well whoever he goes to like i'm watching them because this guy i watched him get his ass beat for 12 years and i've also seen how, like it's, it's one thing i don't know if you've ever been to an nfl game but to actually see someone just air out a fucking 70 yard dime to just a Goliath of a human being is like, wow. I just want to, I, I hope people remember you, man. Like that's the, the most insane thing I've ever seen. And you know, now you go, he went to the Rams and he won a, won a Super Bowl. He's going to probably finish top 10 and all kinds of passing. So Matthew Stafford's my guy right now. I, I'd like to see the lions do well, but they're just such a poorly run franchise and organization. Um, but I tell you, I, Number one, I want to see the Rams do well this year again because of my boy. But I'm really excited to see what happens in Denver this year. Okay. I really okay. am excited to see. <laughs> so this is not where I set out for this interview or this discussion to go. But have you ever, like, had one of your teams just be, like, really dominant? Um. Mm, no, because even the Rams win this year, like it was, you know, they lost a bunch of games at one point in the season. The playoffs was like Stafford with the ball in his hands every single game, winning the game. Like it was just like, ah! <laughs> but no, yeah. like I've never been a Patriots fan or a Detroit Red Wings fan or anything like that. How about you? No, I, I've never been that lucky. The closest I came, uh, the year my son was born, the Washington Nationals won the World Series. And, of course, he was born early September. So, like, we were just home, like, watching all that play out. And that was cool as hell. Yeah. Closest I've ever come. Of course, 
we had the Ducks Stanley Cup run. But they were supposed to get but yeah, bits by the Red Wings first round, and that didn't happen that way. <laughs> yeah, and, and that was also a really, really stacked team. Like, if they didn't win the Stanley Cup with that team, they were never going to win the Stanley Cup. Yeah. So I Yeah, think but just... they also ran into the New Jersey Devils in the prime of Broder's career, right? That's why they didn't win the Cup that year. Yeah. So... <laughs> Of course, we would be remiss if we didn't talk about the music. And uh, uh, this new single, to me, I, I'm going to start with the way it makes me feel, and then I, I will pick your brain about it. There's a lot of like very early Chevelle, early Tool, kind of like catching the late wave of late 90s, early aughts, grunge, alternative metal. And uh, so, so I've got to ask, what, what's the vibe here? Yeah, man. I mean, I mean, all of the above, like, you know, our drummer, Jeff, is a big Tool fan. You know, the common denominator in the band consistently has always been, you know, we all like a lot of the same music, but everybody has their kind of things that they hyper focus on too. And the common denominator for this band has really always been, despite any, whatever era of, of our writing we were in, whether it was more on the summer vibe side or the angry side, is was Soundgarden and Queens of the Stone Age. And when you infuse things like Tool, and, you know, for me, I'm a huge, like, Jane's Addiction fan and that whole, you know, Long Beach scene, you know, early Caius stuff, it just... You know, it was a weird time when 2020 hit, man. You know, we put all our eggs in the 2020 basket because 2019 was a great year for us. We had a big national tour booked. We had, you know, people looking at us and we just basically needed to get on the road and show we could do it. And then everything shut down and we didn't see each other for, you know, about three months. Right. Because it was like, you, I don't even know if you're allowed to breathe outside kind of bullshit for the first little while. Right. And yeah, once we started writing and we got together, we just decided to hyper focus on music and songs. And we were all we were all in weird head spaces. I was fucked up like I was in a, a pretty bad place. Um, and Dylan, the guitar player, just he had that main riff that bono, bono, he, he wrote that and he, he had it. He demoed it. He sent it to us. And when we were finally all able to get together, we're like, let's do let's jump into that one. That riff's sick. And, and we all I just was like. I was very hazy and I, I just barked out what is the chorus riff, like verbatim, the melody, the lyrics. And then we just kind of built it from there. Jeff wrote some melody for the verses. I wrote all the lyrics. Luke had some really good arrangement ideas. Jeff had these stops and starts he wanted to do with the drums and like, trust me, it'll be good. Just try to catch it. And it's like, it was a very like, I'm very grateful for the process because it's us just like finally unhinging all the weird and the darkness in us. And at a time where that's, you know, how things were, especially. And yeah, fearless songwriting. And it made us happy. It was like, well, this is pretty good. We like this. And it kept us wanting to continue doing it during the last couple of years, you know? So I, there, there's a lot you said there that I kind of want to, look into uh first off you are the very first mention i've had of caius nobody ever knows who the hell i'm talking about when i mention caius so fucking great a there um <laughs> i kind of if if you're willing i, I, I want to talk about a dark space because these last two years have been very weird for everyone and in like I, I don't want you to necessarily dig into what you are going through or what anyone else is going through but I feel like we're at a point where we're finally starting to exhale do, do you kind of feel that same vibe um yes but I think it's because people are deciding it's time to live with this and I don't know if we're necessarily there. Um, like for instance, where we are, 
where Toronto is like our province, like kind of like pretty much our state of Ontario is, you know, the doctors are coming out and saying, look, we're not really testing people anymore, but based on what we're seeing, we think it's about a hundred thousand new cases a day. And it's like, that's like, what that's just happening. And we're lifting mandates and we're doing this, we're doing that fair play. It's a, it's a weaker thing, but that's because we all have these shots now. Right. So it's like, I don't know, man. I think a lot of people are like, it's an election year for us. Our premier or our governor is up for re-election, and all of a sudden, all these rules drop after that fucking trucker convoy thing. It's like, man, I swear to fuck, this better actually be safe, or we just lost another year. And I think a lot of people are feeling that way right now, where we are. However, with everything being open, yeah, you can go do what you want. I mean, I've had COVID. I have all three shots, so I'm like. I'm fine. I'm, I don't, I don't care. It's, it's going to be fine. You know, I don't put people in danger. Um, like, it, it, you know, my parents, grandparents, whatever, but um, it has been nice to kind of like, okay, this might actually be the transition year. We don't know that yet, but it, it could be, you know, like it's, there's definitely that energy there for sure. Yeah. I mean, I was kind of talking to you off the air about like, my march was just absolutely absurd. And, 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 and you mentioned you, you had the three shots. I had two. I got the Johnson and Johnson, and then I got the booster because the Johnson and Johnson was one shot and done. Still got it. Whatever. It, it was probably just about the worst five days of my life because I quarantined alone and just sat in a room doing nothing because the same thing. You don't want to put someone else at risk. And I, 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 there was a moment recently, I, I don't know if you've been in the scenario where you've had the opportunity to go to a show yet. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Have you attended? We've been playing. Yep. Yep. It's been there. It's been good. So I, I went to see Corn, Code Orange, and uh, Chevelle. I, I, I wanted to see Chevelle because I'd never seen them before. There was a huge bucket list band for me. And I was like, look. Everything else is just going to shit. I need, I need this. And there was a weird moment. First of all, great people watching crowd because that's a weird damn tour to be lined up together. Code Orange, Chevelle, Corn. <laughs> I saw a father-son Adidas tracksuit. I saw a dude wearing a trap shirt with the sleeves cut off. And then he was wearing khakis like belted up to it above his belly button can't figure that one the hell out a lot of trip pants but yeah for a moment there it was like all right everything's gonna be okay and 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 that's kind of where i feel like and and then we've got everything else going on in the world outside of the pandemic and i feel like we've just like you said this is just kind of maybe the way the world is now yeah yeah, man. And then is, is it bad that like the first three weeks of the Russia Ukraine thing, I was like, I don't even care about COVID anymore. Like we could all like this, like nukes could fly tomorrow. This is fucked. We went from <laughs> pandemic to nuclear war is a real thing. <laughs> it's like, what the? It's just fuck? no downtime. No, oh, man. man. None. At some point, I don't know if you guys had this in Canada, but we had killer hornets like showing up in, mm. in, in Seattle and the Pacific we, we, Northwest. Wild. We had a few like spotted in Canada, but it never really became an issue. But those things are big, man. They're like solid three inches long, man. That's terrifying. So the grand takeaway there is now now that we've gone just down a really dark path <laughs> the music is out there and, and and what are you guys working on uh well it's i mean you've been listening to us for a little while now you can hear the vibe change you can hear you know you can see on our media we've changed logos we have 
you know, we've really honed in on, you know, we had two years to just, we had, we didn't have anything. We had a few singles that we ended up releasing, you know, eyes for you and summer, um, Sunday morning, we, we, we were, we were going on tour. We had a few singles to get us through 2020 and we were going on tour. So when COVID hit, it's like, okay, well, if we ever did want to regroup and rebrand, now would be the time to do it. Um, <clears throat> And well, like I said, we just unapologetically dove into the weird that was always there with us. And it's become unhinged. But at this point, we're all pretty good songwriters. So it's, it's, it's coming together and it's working. So what we've done is we've recorded a shit ton of music. And over the next 18 to 24 months, there's going to be a lot of new drop top alibi music and hopefully uh, tours as well. But all of that is out of our control. So in the in, in the meantime we're just pumping tunes out that's what we're doing and we're getting uh you know new visuals you know there's gonna be some videos there's gonna be this and that it's kind of like we're back to business again which is really exciting because it's like time is a black hole right now like two years is like oh my god it feels like we're starting over but you know we we actually kind of are and the response so far has been really good we <clears throat> The biggest thing for this tune, man, and for all the songs you're about to hear is we did this all old school. We did it live off the floor. All four of us playing in a room. Dill's song was take three. That's what we did. Okay, man, yeah, that little mistake. And eh, it's actually not that bad. Okay, fuck it. Added a couple more guitar layers to it just afterwards. I sang on it. It was done. And we used all vintage jam. I played through a 1974 Marshall Fawn for my tone in that song. And that's why the song sounds the way it does. It's punchy you're at a live show we found our fifth member our producer graham shaw it just this is something we wanted to do for years and we found him and made it happen and now we're just like okay all the songs we like do them <laughs> no so i mean that's another thing that's worth mentioning is it, is it does have a much more authentic feel now mm. don't get me wrong the drop top alibi stuff before was fantastic. But this feels raw. Like you said, live off the floor. It, it, it's very authentic. Uh, I, I think it's accessible. I think there's going to be a lot of people who are going to just click on this immediately. And I think it's the sincerity involved with that. that. Um, what I kind of do also want to talk about because this is something that fascinates me and maybe no one else but the new logo versus mm -hmm. the old logo which is your preference you know the old logo is such a great like kind of like sticker decal all sort of crest and i was doing an inventory of our old stock of merch with like the old logo on it and there's things that I'm pulling out and it's like, oh, this logo looks so good. But we, we have to adjust it if we're going to go this route. And creatively, this is the most authentic and like genuine and fearless we've been. And especially with the new process, it's like, okay, we're going for it. Like, this is what we're doing. So the change was necessary. And our creative director uh, slash media group guru slash photographer and, you know, band mom and all that. And Neil Little, she, you know, when I saw that A for the first time, I was like, well, great. Like, first things first, we have our new crest. And then we kind of amended and worked with and customized sort of what the rest of the lettering would look like for the band name but the first thing that she sent us had that a with it and <clears throat> and the rest of the band ended up liking it but i know for me it was okay well we have the new crest we have the new flag we have the new drum decal like this is great this is an amazing first step so let's let's go for it so i'm going to say that i like the new logo more um, but I'm never going to lose the nostalgia for the old one because there were some good times and some good memories and good things with that thing flying around in the background, you know? Well, it, at this point, it's a collector's item. And, and, and uh, I'm going to ask you again in like 20 years. We're going to have this conversation again. And 
surely by then at some point you'll have done some like 40th anniversary crazy ass logo with like some lips or something and 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 we're, we're going to compare and contrast and really break down the graphic design of it but I, I, I think the new logo is a step well, in the right direction. To, I'll, be able to come visit, I'll be able to come visit you at your, at your retirement home in Seattle by then, I'm sure, and stuff, you know? Yeah, I mean, I mean, by then we'll be much closer. It'll, it, it'll work out very well. Brandon, it is always a pleasure to chat with you. Uh, we'll have to talk after the Stanley Cup when yes. I'm pretty sure... I don't want to jinx you, but right now my, my dark horse candidate is the Toronto Maple Leafs, and uh, I want it on record. I think the Leafs could do it this year. Well, buddy, you and you and all of Leafs Nation for sure. But I've I've those guys have broken my heart way too many times. I'll believe it when I see it. <laughs> but yes right. always a pleasure chatting with you nate thanks for having me and uh we'll have to do this again for sure absolutely my fingers are crossed and uh you have a good night peace